Well, let me first of all um, say that I apologize for having to give this talk in English. I can still read French very confidently, but I use it so little that it would be painful for you and embarrassing for me if I tried to speak in French. Um, since Claire mentioned the book that Paul and I are just finishing up, maybe I'll start by telling you a little story about it. Uh, the, the work in time theory of consciousness. I told uh, uh, Bernie Barnes, who's one of the grand old people of consciousness studies and the person that reintroduced empirical work to consciousness about 20 years ago. I told him this time, and his comment was, that is the most audacious title I've ever heard. And I said, Bernie, we said, ah, unified theory, not the unified theory. But he wasn't significantly qualified. Um, this talk today could actually have any one of three different titles. <coughs> one of the most are the situated cognition and the extended mind hypothesis. Part of the that actually describes what I'm going to do. But it could equally be called six E's and a D. And the reference there is to a conference that's coming up in about three weeks, organized by Sean Gallagher at the um, University of Central Florida which is called the Four E's Conference. Well, I think he's missed a couple, and I'll explain that when I get there. It could also be called what it was originally called, uh, My Blackberry and Me, Forever One or Just Friends. <coughs> and the Forever One is an allusion to the idea built into the extended mind hypothesis, and some people think some of the other versions of situated cognition, that uh, cognitive tools as Andy calls them, Andy Clark calls them, like the Blackberry or computers or the web, um, are actually um, part of the cognitive system that I am. They're not merely tools, they're actually somehow part of me. And eventually we will get to the Blackberry and to the web as examples of uh, what some of these people are saying. So for the uh, the motto of the slogan for this talk, if you like, could be the Clark and Chalmers, the very well-known saying by Clark and Chalmers that cognition ain't all in the head. And it, that in turn, is an allusion to something that Hillary Putnam said about 30 years ago, that meaning ain't all in the head. And we will indeed look at uh, the source of this uh, saying a bit later. <coughs> this talk, talk we're giving today, is roughly half survey then half advocacy. The first thing I'm going to do is just to survey some of the variants of the idea that to understand cognition, you have to study it in its natural context, which is the core idea, as I understand it, of <coughs> situated cognition in all its variations. Part of the reason I want to do this is that these terms don't have very stable meaning in the literature. They float around a lot. And so I think trying to stabilize them a bit would be a good idea. But also, um, the range of ideas um, embraced under the ample skirts of the notion of situated cognition is in fact quite a lot wider, quite a lot more diverse than is sometimes recognized. Now, this idea, the idea that uh, there's something suspect about moving cognitive systems to highly artificial environments like psych labs. That uh, to understand <coughs> cognition, you have to study it in natural context. This idea um, often gets uh, tied to a much stronger idea. The idea that something outside the brain and skin is not simply crucial to understanding cognition but it's actually essential to, or even constitutive of, something being a cognitive system. It's something outside brain and skin is part of what a cognitive system is. Do you allow questions, or would you rather reserve them to the Well, I don't, I don't mind. Sure, go ahead. So, so you've used the word cognition so many times in the same days, and isn't, could you just give us the thumbnails? Or the <laughs> oh, that's already a long way back. Um, <coughs> there's a number of a number of thumbnails that have been attempted in this far, none of them work absolutely perfectly. But probably um, 
the best is that a cognitive system is a system that operates by generating representations of various kinds and performing operations on representations. So comparing them, drawing inferences from them, tying them together in various orders, <coughs> using them to explain other things, and so on. So the core idea then would be the idea of representation. And the reason this is not a bad um, characterization is that even the people who argue that representation is not the core of cognition, for example, dynamic systems people, um, need always erect something in its place. So they have a representation survey. Uh, so I think putting representation at the core of the idea of cognition is not too bad as a okay. one-liner. So for that sentence, cognition ain't all in the head. Yeah. Uh, is this a proper interpretation? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get controversial about representations. I draw a picture of a face which represents his face. And since I'm a cognitive system, Draw, making that representation, the pencil is part of the system, and therefore a cognition in all in the head. Is that an interpretation of what you're saying? Well, actually, what uh, Chalmers and Clark mean by this notion of uh, the extended mind is not absolutely crystal clear, and um, we'll look a little bit at that later. Yeah, roughly. Uh, that would certainly, the pencil and paper would certainly count as a cognitive technology, for example, in Andy Clark says something that we use to extend cognition, offload cognition, <coughs> processing onto something outside the brain. Okay, um, the advocacy part of the paper in the talk is that the strongest, the stronger claim does not in fact arise all over the place in situated cognition, contrary to what we sometimes believe, and moreover is mostly wrong. Um, eventually we will we will look at wireless mobile appliances such as the BlackBerry and the internet as test cases to examine the stronger idea. So, the survey part. A wide variety of different ideas and a wide variety of different terms have been generated in recent literature which is, calls itself broadly the situated cognition literature. The original notion, which goes back to Ed Hutchins and Cognition in the Wild in 95, is, quoting O'Connor and Glenberg there, that cognition is stretched over mind, body, activity, and culturally organized settings. So cognition doesn't happen in one head. It happens in a complex interacting system of agents of some kind. And the system that Ed Hutchins himself studied initially was um, number of cognitive agents navigating a very large ship, where no single person on the ship knows how to navigate the ship. But by combining the various things that the various people do know how to do, like take depth readings, read radar, work a radio, send controls to the engine room, and whatever else was on a, on a big ship, by coordinating the various small tasks that people did know how to do appropriately, you get the result you want. The ship goes where you want, even though nobody navigates the ship. That's the idea of distributed cognition. Um, the notion of embedded cognition gets used very loosely, but the core idea is simply that cognitive systems are embedded in a physical setting. Um, embodied cognition is the same idea, but a bit more specific, that cognition, at least our kind of cognition, is embedded specifically in a body. And if you want to understand how it works, you have to understand the effect of embodiment on it. Um, there's a number of ideas that um, float around the idea, the, uh, that cluster around the general idea, that to understand cognition, you have to understand it in its various environments. Um, this is probably the heartland of situated cognition as originally understood. The, um, only thing I have to say about this is that I think it's very important to distinguish social from physical environments. And I was talking to Marion, so I think you're somewhere to about this a bit this morning. Uh, because um, how cognitive systems interact with social and non-social environments are quite different. Uh, next on the list, um, this list is organized roughly in terms of strength, in terms of the uh, 
the strength of the commitment that um, uh, the <coughs> theorist is making. Next on the list of E's, I would put inactive cognition. Um, there's actually two ideas that go with this, but the main one is that representation, uh, sorry, there are two ideas that go with this, and neither one of them more made than the other. The first is that representation is mostly construction. That we're directly aware of only a tiny little window of the world at any one time, and the rest is inferred, constructed, presupposed, or whatever. This is uh, Kevin O'Regan's uh, grand illusion hypothesis about perception. And the other is that a lot of what we call representation is in fact motor responsiveness or preparation for motor responsiveness in a closed loop relationship to the world. Next comes the idea that something about cognition is external. External is this is usually called. This uh, notion is more popular in philosophical circles than in non-philosophical circles. And uh, I'll say a little more to introduce it properly later. Here, let me say for the moment something that it comes in norm normative and non-normative flavors. And the normative flavor is um, generally associated with Donald Davidson, who alas is no longer with us. And the non-normative flavor was initiated by Hillary Putnam, who is still very much with us. And then the last, I'm sorry, there's a line cut off here. Um, the last and uh, strongest uh, uh, variant of this general idea is the extended mind hypothesis. And this is the idea that's captured in the Clark Chalmers slogan that cognition ain't only in the head. That um, something about the cognitive system itself, part of the cognitive system itself, is located outside the brain and body. Interestingly, the first four variants, that is to say, uh, distributed, embedded, and embodied, and environmental cognition, which, as I say, is sort of the heart of situated cognition. The first four variants have typically been advocated by experimentalists rather than by philosophers. The last three, inactive, external, and extended, have tended to be advocated and written about more by philosophers than by experimentalists. Um, leading theorists of the first four sets of ideas include Ed Hutchins, I've already mentioned, uh, David Kirsch, who uh, initiated the idea of epistemic structures in the environment. It's a computer a book, those would be epistemic structures. Rodney Brooks, who um, is famous for the idea that the world is its own best representation that we can navigate in the world without building representations of the world. And Andy Clark, sitting in his very big, very noisy 1969 Ford bright red convertible, which he had to sell when he went back to England, um, who has made many contributions in this area, but probably the one for which he's uh, best known is the idea of cognitive technologies and the idea of cognitive environments. One holds, well, Hutchins is a special case because um, Hutchins wasn't arguing that cognition as such has any particular character. He's just, he was simply arguing that a lot of cognitive tasks require coordinated cognitive agents. Um, so he's a special case. What ties the other three together? Well, um, not all of them, as well as all of these um, points of view, but they generally speaking characterize positions and situated cognition. The first is that we offload cognition to a very great extent. That we rely on cognitive artifacts, cognitive technology, and uh, other aspects of cognitive. Secondly, that the classical picture of cognition presents it as doing a lot more representing than is actually going on. That a lot of what Classical cognition thought, classical cognitive science thought of as representing the world, is in fact um, hooking up to the world in ways that either minimize representation or are non-representational, and yet allow us to navigate the world just as well as if we did have a map. But 
And one of the arguments made for this is that representation is computationally intensive. It takes a lot of information processing capacity. And so the more you can replace it with something that's less computationally intensive, the better. Uh, closely connected to this, the Rodney Brooks idea that in cognitive activity, the world is often its own best model. That the situation can take the place of representation. So if you can hook up to the world in such a way that you can use the world itself as your map, as your guide, that's way cheaper computationally than having to reproduce a picture of the world in the form of some kind of mental map or representation and use that to navigate the world. So that's the third common characteristic idea. Another idea that's exposed by many of these people is that cognition is a much less tightly integrated set of capacities than the classical picture would have. But cognition is, in fact, uh, a series or set of evolution-driven special purpose modules. Some of them have become linked up in fairly interesting and tightly integrated ways. Many of them continue to apply in loose formation. Some of them have been recruited for new purposes, the notion of acceptation. Uh, but in general, um, the evolutionary point of view is uh, central to um, people who write about the cognition of the situation. And the last, and this is not um, a position that's espoused by all these people, certainly by a lot of them, is that temporal dynamics are important. In fact, the dynamic systems theory is uh, apt to be a better guide to cognition than logic or symbolic structure, the kind of stuff that was studied in classical uh, cognitive science, classical artificial intelligence. So that's kind of what ties uh, these people together. And certainly these are interesting claims. Uh, we could ask, could they be true? And I think that um, the answer is there's clearly something to some of them, though it would take some sorting out to decide how much to which. But that's not what matters here. It's not what interests me here. What's interesting about these, this set of claims is that not a single one of them requires us to change the traditional picture of the boundaries of the mind. They are all quite compatible with the traditional idea that minds or cognitive systems or people end at the outside, at the skin, if not at the edges of the brain. The external elements which these people emphasize are not held to constitute the mind. They're not even held to be essential to being a mind. They're held to be important for understanding minds. They're uh, crucial tools that minds make use of, as I said, to offload cognitive uh, demands, but they're not part of what makes up the mind. Indeed, two of the four, the idea of being embedded and being embodied, aren't even on the world side of the mind-world divide. They are properties of cognitive systems conventionally understood. Uh, it's roughly this distinction between one's skeleton, which is in some way part of oneself, and uh, one's cognitive tools, like one's computer, which is outside oneself. And the versions of the extended or external mind hypothesis that are interesting, because they, they involve strong commitments, are versions that argue that there is something outside the brain and body that nonetheless is essential to or constitutive of, constitutive of, I can't say that word today for some reason, a mind. Okay. Um, the three last variants, which as I say have been more typically uh, espoused by philosophers than by experimentalists. The first I want to say a word about, a fairly quick word, is the inactive approach. As I said, the inactive approach uh, has two um, advances two main things. One is that perception is largely a grand illusion that we see clearly through about six degrees of arc in, in, uh, in focal vision. And everything else is at such low resolution that uh, we don't actually get much information from it. Mm -hmm. So basically it's selective. It's selective. Well, it's selective is that we don't select. I mean, it's, 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 it's it, the visions, the, the, um, 
The retina does the selecting for us because the retina has the fovea, which is the only high resolution part of the retina. Everything else is very low resolution. Just to nail down the view, let me, let me tell you a story, give you an example. Uh, there's uh, an experiment that's been done a number of times in which um, you show someone a paragraph of text, say on a computer screen, and then you mount an eye tracker. Um, <coughs> and you watch where <coughs> the eyes are pointing. As the eyes are coming up, um, so, so if, if, let me put it this way. You see the eyes are on the first word. As soon as the eye tracker tells you that, the rest of the paragraph turns into gibberish, nonsense. It's nonsense that has roughly the same shape as words. So it doesn't change color, doesn't change shape, doesn't move around. And, ways that would immediately attract attention, but it's no longer words. Then as the eyes move to the second word or the second couple of words, they pop up in the right form, and what the eye was just looking at turns into nonsense. And so on through the whole paragraph. And what's really striking about this is people never notice. Never. And Dan Dennett tells the story about uh, him doing the um, the eye tracking uh, the experiment himself. He says he, he sat down in front of the screen, and like most academics who are text hungry, he immediately began to read the paragraphs. We all we read labels on ketchup bottles. So he got halfway through the paragraph, two thirds of it, started to be a little bored. He said, "When's the experiment going to start?" And the person who was running the uh, the experiment said, "It's almost over." He literally hadn't noticed that there was anything wrong with the paragraph he was reading. Well, that's the grand illusion hypothesis on the book. All we see with any kind of resolution is a tiny little window in the middle of foveal vision. Everything else is very, very low resolution. And uh, connected to this, and some, some, you know, some um, important um, things follow from this, the most important of which is that most of what's in our visual field is not stuff we're seeing. It's stuff we're populating the visual field with in some other way, either by assuming that the world has remained that way, drawing inferences about how the world would be, simply um, coloring it in the way we color in the blind spot. We don't, we don't see an absence where the blind spot is. Um, I mean, there's, just, there's an absence of representation, but there's no representation of absence. So the world is based, our visual world is basically a construct. That's, that's the <coughs> inference drawn from this. The other strong um, thesis advanced by the inactive approach is that uh, action, not representation, is the heart of cognition. And a lot of what we um, have traditionally thought of as representing the world is in fact either responses to an action we've taken in the world or preparation for taking another action. And that's why they call it the inactive view. Well, um, the inactive view is very interesting. Might even be true in some respects. Those are some of the people who have been principally behind it, Kevin Reagan, Francesco Valera, and Alvin Noe, in case you had any doubts, Noe is the one with the hat on the right. Um, the interesting thing about this point of view is that here, too, there is no necessary extension of the boundaries of the mind. There's a kind of internal extension. Representation, as in the quote there, uh, is connected to sensory motor knowledge. So representation gets extended to sensory motor knowledge. Sensory motor knowledge gets extended to become the core of representation. That all happens within cognitive systems tradition understood. There's no extension of the boundaries of the mind or to the cognitive system to anything outside the mind. And you can see a pattern developing here. We've now been through five of the seven variants, and not one of them yet has advocated anything like the extended mind hypothesis. So let's look at a couple who do. The first is externalism. Um, this is an idea um, usually advanced by philosophers. And the question we want to ask is, do they, uh, are they committed to some 
version of the extended mind hypothesis. Well, as I said, uh, externalism tends to come in two flavors. One's a normative uh, flavor, and one's a non-normative flavor. Um, the first thing to note about these um, points of view is that they are philosophers' ideas. <coughs> they are not empirical, they're not causal, they're not explanatory. They are somehow conceptual claims. Uh, they are, at any rate, claims that are strikingly different from the five claims we've just looked at so far. OK, so how does the normativity of mind and idea go? Um, I might say I chose these two people as representing it just because I realized at one point that I didn't have an image of a single female in this presentation. And I wanted to get at least one in. Ruth Milk is certainly a very good person to have here. The basic idea behind the normativity of mind uh, hypothesis is that to be a mind, a system has to meet certain standards. Um, and there's a whole host of ideas about what these standards consist of. I mean, uh, Donald Davidson basically argued that to be a mind, you have to behave in such a way that you're acceptable as a mind to other minded creatures, so-called intersubjective triangulation. Um, another um, idea, also due to Davidson, is that to be a mind, your discourse has to be interpretable as telling enough of the truth enough of the time. Um, Dennett, at one point, put biographical coherence at the center of things. To be a mind is something that has had a coherent history. Um, Fred Gretzky did that too, actually. Others put um, functioning as design at the heart of things, and there are yet other genes. Um, the core idea is that to be a mind, you have to meet a certain standard. So, just to get it out of the way, a snail that if you pinch it, it hurts doesn't take, as, as a consequence of that, have a mind. No, it's not. I mean, a snail may very well feel pain. But to get to be a mind is to engage in activity that can be assessed from the point of view of truth telling and so on. Um, I mean, there's a species that's problem in this discourse, among other things. Uh, the, uh, to share in the uh, like, uh, example of the South, or something, uh, that uh, the language you speak uh, determines a uh, certain extent. Uh, no, because it's not a causal claim. It's not a claim about anything causing anything else. It's a claim about what something has to be able to do in order to be appropriately labeled in a certain way. So it's, it's purely, if you like, criteria claim. It's not a causal claim at all. And that's part of what makes it so different from the, the various of situation cognition we looked at a few minutes ago. Because at the heart of every one of them is a causal claim. Um, I think the important thing for our purposes here, we're looking at the extended mind, the extended mind hypothesis, is that in every one of these cases, being a mind now does depend essentially on something outside the brain. And something outside maybe society or uh, uh, being in an intersubjective relationship to others, it can be evolution, uh, whatever. And this, uh, as I said, was not true of any of the views we examined earlier. So finally, we have a view that argues that something about mindedness is essentially outside brains. And it's interesting that you have to go to philosophers to find this idea. And beyond snails. I'm, I'm the snails advocate here. I'm just announcing it now. I'm going to be speaking on behalf of snails. Yeah. And what the reason this is different is because um, these philosophers have stipulated that there's certain things beyond what a snail's uh, whatever, you know, I'm not allowed to use the M word, but the the state, the internal state that a snail is capable of is not good enough to meet their standards. But it's their standards we're talking about and not necessarily what internal states really are like. Well, I mean, to call it anything in mind, you have to be uh, implicitly uh, adopting and applying certain standards. Uh, the only question is which one, are, which ones are the appropriate ones? Um, I mean, one, one way that, one way that, uh, to cut this particular Gordian knot is to take these people to be talking about our kind of mind and just silent on the rest. Um, then the claim would be you know, to be a mind of the kind that we are, a truth teller, an intention former, an action initiator, a writer, a reader, a thinker. To be that kind of mind, you have to satisfy certain norms. 
And it would still be an interesting claim if to be that kind of mind, part of the mind has to be outside the body. That would still be an interesting claim. Um, now, the thing about these uh, views is that while they are certainly more than causal claims, they're saying that meeting these norms is essential to being our kind of mind or whatever, they are still arguing something weaker than the Clark Chambers hypothesis, which <coughs> is that something outside the mind is constitutive, is part of what it is to be a mind. So even this view is weaker than uh, the strongest form of the extended mind hypothesis. Because that would be the extended our kind of mind hypothesis. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm mad. Uh, the other form of externalism I want to look at is so-called content externalism. And this is the idea, um, to use Putnam's famous phrase, meanings ain't just in the head. The core idea is some aspect of what gives meaning to lexical strings, to strings of letters. Uh, equally, some aspect of what gives content to representational vehicles like acts of seeing and hearing. That some aspect of content or meaning consists of a, a relationship between the strings or the vehicles and something else. This idea gets going um, from an idea that's been around in cognitive science for a long time, but one of which I'm actually very suspicious, and that is that brains can't do meanings. That all brains can do are what is called, in the jargon, I think very misleadingly, syntax, by which is meant physically salient relationships, like size, shape, order, spacing. That's all <coughs> brains can do. And so if meaning gets in there anywhere, it's got to be by brains coming into relationship with worlds. Another way to make the same point is that neurons are all much of a muchness. And so if uh, one neuron has the job of visual representation, another set of neurons has the job of auditory representation, another set of neurons has the job of storing memories, another set of neurons has the job of expressing acts of imagination. These differences can't reside in the brain itself because there are no appropriate differences in the brain. The differences have to reside with how different parts of the brain are hooked up to something outside of the brain. That's the core idea of content externalism. There's just a few of the candidates for what the um, relevant hookup might look like. For Jerry Fodor, it's causal and nomological relationships. For Fred Gretzky, it's representational function. Um, for a number of people, um, um, Town of Verge uh, in particular, the crucial external element is um, expert knowledge and others or something like that. It doesn't matter what the, what the crucial external element is. What matters is they claim there has to be one. Okay, so uh, the key point for us then, the take home message in the context of this talk, is uh, that we have at last found something that is certainly essential to being a mind, something that's outside the brain, and um, is very likely a constitutive of minds. So very likely part of what it is to be a mind is to be in this relationship, for the brain to be in this relationship, whatever the crucial relationship is, to something. And at last we get to the extended mind hypothesis, which is where the survey turns to advocacy. I think that's the most remarkable picture. It must have been taken about 3 in the morning. Um, but it was on Dave Chalmers' website, so it's fair enough to grab it. Um, the extended mind hypothesis goes even further than content externalism. It argues that well, first of all, as we just saw, the um, extended uh, content hypothesis, or external content hypothesis, argues that an aspect of content is outside the brain and skin. The extended mind hypothesis maintains that the cognitive system itself, not just the contents of the cognitive system, the cognitive system itself extends beyond the boundaries of 
brain and skin. And here's the crucial argument. They call it the parity argument. If, as we confront some task, a part of the world functions as a process which, were it done in the head, we would have no hesitation in recognizing as part of the cognitive system, then that part of the world is, so we claim, part of the cognitive system. Cognitive processes ain't all in the head. And essentially what we're going to do for the rest of this talk is examine that claim. Um, <clears throat> first of all, how do they argue for the claim? Well, like the good philosophers they are, they basically appeal to thought experiments. And there's a number of them, but the crucial one, I think, is the Otto and Inga thought experiment. Um, I may get two characters backwards, it doesn't matter. The um, core idea here is that one of them, I think it was Inga, has intact declarative memory. And so uh, relies on uh, uh, the usual brain structures to provide the memories that she needs to navigate cognitively in the world. Otto gets around just as well in the world. But Otto has no declarative memory at all and has to rely instead on some kind of prosthetic. There's a long series of notebooks, the uh, Blackberry, a lot of worldly information stored in, whatever, whatever, whatever. And the claim of the parity argument is that if Inga's memory is part of her, so is Otto's. But Otto's memory, or memory surrogate, or substitute, say what you like, is located outside the brain and body. So part of cognition is, in his case, and can in every case, be located outside the brain and body. That's the parity argument. OK, let's turn to assessing this argument. The first point we made about it, and I'm surprised that no one else has made this point that I've seen is that their claim can be rendered completely trivial. Because the term cognitive system is a term of art. It's a term invented by cognitive science. And we can define it in any old way we like. I could say that it's essential to being a cognitive system that that chair be part of the cognitive system. And you may say, well, that's not very useful most of a cognitive system. And I would say, sure, I don't care about usefulness. I'm making my jargon up as I go. The term cognitive system is a piece of jargon. We can define it as we like. <coughs> what C and C have in mind, however, is clearly not true. And so I think the first thing we have to do is to find a way to express it that um, avoids the triviality. One way is to switch from cognitive system to mind. And that was the way I was first inclined to go. There's something about minds is external to the brain and skin. The trouble is, and it was actually uh, uh, Mason Cash, uh, down in Florida, who uh, persuaded me of this originally. The term mind is also a term of art. It's just a somewhat older term of art. It's been around for a few hundred years instead of a few dozen years. Um, if so, then I'm inclined to think that their claim should be couched in terms of the human person or the human agent. And uh, the claim then would be that something about people, something about human agents, extends beyond brain and skin. And that, folks, is not a trivial claim. If it's true, it'd be very exciting. Does the parity argument establish this claim? Well, let me first note Mason's support that it doesn't have. And uh, John and Clark are very clear about this. Content externalism does not support the extended mind hypothesis. Why not? Because content externalism is talking about something essentially inert and passive being outside the mind, informational content. Whereas what Clark and Chalmers have in mind is that part of active cognition, part of what does the cognize is located outside the brain itself. <coughs> um, so let us look at a couple of examples of this. Well, there are two major extensions of cognition in the past 30, 40 years. And uh, some of the some people think that they support very strongly the idea that minds have become extended. One is things like the BlackBerry. I mentioned the BlackBerry because 
I give this talk outside of Canada sometimes, and I love to tell people that libraries made in Canada. Almost nobody knows that. Um, and of course, the other is the World Wide Web. Now, there is no question that these technologies have massively <coughs> extended our cognitive reach. No question at all. As cognitive technologies, they are unexampled in human history. The question is, of course, are they examples of minds actually being extended beyond, or persons actually being extended beyond brain and body? I'm actually going to start not with the, uh, the main course, but with the preliminary issue. And that's the issue of what the coupling that ties brains to wireless appliances and the internet, not to mention books and paper and other human beings, is actually like. But I think that coupling is a bit different from <coughs> the way Clark and uh, Chalmers conceive it, and this itself has implications for their extended mind hypothesis. Then we get to the main myth: what should we include within the mind or within the person? Um, starting to uh, take a bit of time here, and I want to wrap up in about five, so no more than ten minutes. So let me just say that the basic idea. Uh, here is while Clark and Chalmers, especially Andy Clark, claims that um, minds or agents are hooked up to the world in the way control mechanisms are hooked up to the systems they control, the thermostats say, what he calls continual reciprocal causation. So something that the control causes a change in the system, the change in the system causes a change in the control. And causation going back and forth like that all the time. That's not at all what my relationship to this computer screen or my relationship to you is like. The crucial difference <coughs> is that my relationship to you and the computer screen is a semantic relationship. It's based on things like co-reference, implication, shared syntax, shared conventions about meaning. Um, and it also has an normative dimension, a pr presumption of truth-telling and intention to communicate. Now, whatever you think of this kind of semantic relationship, it's very different from continuous reciprocal coupling because it doesn't produce a powerful relationship of the standard kind. Whereas, um, where you can genuinely talk about extensions of cognitive systems, for example, in uh, land, local area networks, where you could ask how far does the land extend, you are asking about a part whole relationship. What series of parts make up the whole? What parts are outside the whole? That's not what you get when you're dealing with semantic coupling. Um, Okay. It should go away in a second, I hope. I don't like to change. There we go. Okay, uh, enough on that, because I say I want to wrap up a little bit here. So let's turn to the second question, which is, I think, the important one. What should we include in the mind, or the human person, or the agent? I think the point about coupling has some effect, but it's certainly not decisive. So what might you? Well, the first thing to note is the extended mind hypothesis includes an implausibly large range of things. In the age of blackberries and the World Wide Web, on their hypothesis, my cognition would contain as parts your cognition and the cognition of thousands, maybe millions of other people. Because I'm in a semantic relationship by the web to thousands, if not millions of people. On their picture, the social world would not be a matter of a few billion essentially separate minds. Every mind would have a huge number of other minds as parts, and in a huge number of other ways, too. This, to my way of thinking, is a very messy ontology, a very messy picture of uh, personhood. Um, one approach to this would just be to bite the bullet. And I have taxed Andy Clark with this argument, and that's exactly what he does. He says, if the truth is messy, so be it. 
For me, this is not so good because um, I don't know how to think of me being a part of you and you being a part of me. In particular, I don't know how to think of me being a part of a part of me. And that relationship is built in to the core of the idea of the extended mind hypothesis. Um, is there a more credible view? I mean, if, if, if the only story we could tell here was the messy Andy Clark story, well, that's the story we have to live with, messy as it is. If, on the other hand, there's a simpler, more credible view, then uh, I think we should adopt it. Uh, uh, like, uh, what's the relationship between uh, like cognition and, say, offloading some skill you have to uh, make it like uh, unconscious, like uh, playing piano uh, without thinking about it. That's, that's a bit like uh, offloading it to, say, playing a CD of a, a song. I mean, uh, where does uh, like, uh, 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 volition and uh, the build ability to make choices uh, and, and the actual hardware you're offloading stuff to its uh, Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, last, the earlier stuff I talked about earlier, I think offloading cognition onto cognitive appliances and various, various kinds doesn't require any alteration or picture of the human person at all. Uh, the latter point is an interesting one. Um, when Clark and Chilmers say that they're advocating that an active part of cognition is outside the brain, it's interesting that um, they pick on a fairly narrow range of examples. For example, they will locate computational power outside the brain. But they won't. They don't locate, as you say, decision making outside the brain. We'll come back. We'll come to that. There's, I think. This is, I think it's a good point, and there's something in. It. <coughs> okay. So, skipping a, a couple of paragraphs. Um, as I said, I'm going to talk about persons, and the question: How far the person that I am extends start, starts. I think doesn't end. It starts from how far do I extend? How far does the self extend? and then we'll build other elements of personhood into it. Why? Well, because it's me that's the locus of consciousness and agency in the person I am. So, how far do I extend? I think there's four criteria that we can invoke here. And they, are all, uh, they all have the result that um, I extend roughly as far as my skin, but none of them for that reason. I mean, the skin is, an art, is not a functional boundary. It's not a cognitive boundary. There's no magic in it. However, I am functionally related to the surface of my body in some interesting ways. If I reach over and close your eyes, that doesn't affect my vision in the slightest. If I close my eyes, I stop seeing. And similarly for a whole host of other phenomena. So one natural criterion for how far I extend is C1. I extend to the limits of the body on which I'm perceptually and sensationally dependent. Closely related, um, if I will your arm to go up, I can think of it as intensely as I can, focus on it as I like, and unless I tell you about it, or unless tell me it's true, your arm's not going to go anywhere. If I will my arm to go up, goes up, no intermediaries. This is a notion that um, <coughs> was a long time ago labeled the notion of basic action. The basic action is one that can be achieved simply by willing it. You don't need to bring about any, any intermediary. So another suggestion is, I extend as far as the movements I can control by willing basic actions. Note that neither of these suggested criteria ends the mind, or ends me, neatly at the skin. Perception can be dependent on prosthetic devices, like glasses, which extend the functional boundary of that. Um, tools might be considered to be extensions too, because tools can be controlled by basic actions. Nonetheless, the boundary ends up roughly where we thought it was all along. <coughs> There's two more criteria, and they're both a bit more complicated, but I think in fact they're both more useful too. One is that I extend as far as my mental states extend. Mental states I'm aware of simply by having them. 
So to know what I'm feeling right now, I don't need to look in the mirror. I just need to have the feeling. If um, I've got a toothache, I don't need to do complicated neuroscience to discover I have a toothache. All I need to do is have the toothache. It tells me about itself directly. Well, the suggestion is that states that I can be aware of <clears throat> simply by having them are states of me, and um, states that I can't be aware of in that way are not. And that's the third suggested criteria. The fourth connects directly to your point. We might make a decision between a distinction between um, states that are part of a decision-making process and states that I can take into account in making decisions. And I think this distinction is one of the things that's very clearly lacking in the Clark Chalmers picture. Um, then the suggestion would be that I extend to the states that are part of my decision-making process, but I don't extend to, sorry, there's a mistake there, I don't extend to things that I can just take into account. Pulling this all together, we end up with the following four suggestions for how far I extend. They don't draw the line in exactly the same place. Some of them draw the line roughly at the skin. Some of them draw the line at the boundaries of active cognition, such as decision making. And that's interesting in its own right. I mean, it's interesting that we don't have a uh, well-integrated concept for how far people extend. Presumably, we don't have one because we've never really needed one. Uh, but we don't. The other point that's interesting is that not one of them leads us to anything like the extended mind hypothesis. They are all, they all end the mind well inside of the extended mind. Well, then all you need to do to round this out is to go from uh, how far I extend to how far the person that I am extends. And there's actually some interesting questions here, but I've gone on long enough, so I'm going to draw some conclusions. Um, the question is, do any of these things put any pressure on us to push the person I am out beyond brain or skin? And uh, we've seen one kind of pressure, prosthetics and tools. However, in my opinion, neither the parity argument nor the examples that are sometimes used to support it, examples like wireless devices and the World Wide Web, put pressure of any kind on us to give up the suggested criteria C1 to C4. Not in the slightest. More generally, I think, our cognitive technologies put no pressure on us to abandon the traditional picture of the boundaries of the mind. And that's where very old fashioned, very low key, very unradical conclusion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, well, that's really disappointing. So you're actually against the extended mind hypothesis. So yeah. it's not, there's no point in attacking it either. Well, I, <laughs> well, I certainly think there's a point in attacking it. I didn't think there was a point in attacking it. This talk would be rather a waste of time. Uh, do I think it's true? Not in the slightest. Uh, let's go there, there, and there. Um, I'd like to use uh, another example from the animal world to uh, find it. You, you might not want to call a spider you know, uh, say that it has a mind, but it's certainly a cognitive system. And a spider is almost blind on its, uh, its web. And I think a spider with its web, of course, the, the, the pen, the pen with the web on web is in uh, It's You could make, I think, an interesting case for the, you know, the, the spider and its web being an extended cognitive system. Well, you can make that case by definition. So you can define the notion of cognitive system any way you like. Well, that's an easy answer. Um, I mean, the, what, what you have to do is to define a concept where the claim becomes an interesting one, one that could be true or false on the basis of facts, not just on the basis of definitions. Um, and certainly, um, I mean, I'll grant you this much without any argument, and that is that um, simpler cognitive systems than ours are more closely coupled to their environments than we are. Can't, uh, can't cart the environment around inside them in the way we can. And um, <coughs> there would be implications for that to be thought through, but I'm not sure quite sure how they are going to go. So, uh, our company in the world would be much more flexible than lower than I thought. Well, I mean, one of the neat things about us is we have this massive memory system. 
So we can cart our former environments around with us forever. I mean, I can move from here to Timbuktu and essentially nothing changes about me because, except for a few perceptions, because once we have adult human cognition, it doesn't no longer has to be immediate day by day or even hour by hour, week by week coupling. And so there's a much clearer boundary between what we do cart around with us and what we don't have to cart around with us than there would be, say, in the case of a spider. Yes, um, thank you very much for your interesting talk. I'm just by coincidence here giving a lecture myself on other subjects. Um, so I'm not in this field, um, but I found it very interesting to listen. Um, is this uh, um, part of the this discussion of external minds was something new to me. Is this part of the postmodern discussion or is it especially from America or Canada? Because I, 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 I didn't come over it. Before. Well, definitely not America or Canada because uh, David Chalmers is Australian and Andy Clark is Scottish. Um, they are both English speaking. Um, there's a relationship to be thought of between the more radical forms or the, the stronger forms of uh, the situated cognition idea and um, ideas in contemporary French thought such as there is no author and text is essentially decentered and so on. Yeah, from home. Um, I've never done it. And so I'm a little loath to say much about it. Um, well, let me, let, me, let me say this. And this is a fairly uh, audacious thing to say, but I think, it's some, I think I could defend it. If my very old-fashioned argument works against Clark and Chalmers, it would work a fortiori against people like Foucault and Derrida. I mean, if you're an old-fashioned guy like me, the old-fashionedness extends to everybody who's in the opposite camp. You know, I think I can defend that. Yeah, well, I'm not in favor of postmodern uh, ideas either. Uh, and also not Luhmann. Hmm. You know the work of Luhmann? No. Luhmann? Luhmann? Yeah. No. Uh, so there was some... I think, yes. Um, I have a problem with the definition of the word mind, especially as for the end of your talk, you seem to segue from mind to consciousness. Your, your conclusion is the mind, the external, and the beyond the skin. The definition, what you were seem to be talking about was much more consciousness than mind, which I don't mind, but that's mind. But <laughs> if that's your definition, are you using that interchangeably at the end of your talk? Um, here was the structure of the argument. What's, what do you mean? What type of consciousness is there's not one type of awareness, one, not one type, there's several types of consciousness and awareness that you're more aware of than aware of? One quick but also very cheap answer would be that's why I talked about yesterday. And I give a talk on consciousness to McGill yesterday. Um, here is the structure of the argument. Um, we can't phrase the strong hypothesis in terms of cognitive systems because there it's, it can be made trivially true, true by definition. Um, it's natural then to phrase it in terms of minds, but the notion of mind, that little four letter word, is also a fairly recent development in thought and may also just be a term of art. What is it? What term captures something that certainly exists in nature? Well, the notion of a human person or human agent. So then let's phrase the question in terms of how far does the human agent extend? What are the boundaries between agency and non-agency? And then I said, um, one way to get a grip on this question is to ask how far I extend. Because I'm the locus, the center of agency and personhood. Now, take that as the, what the I there is referring to is self. This is controversy. Then I said there is more to personhood than simply the self, so pinned down. And so at the end of the day, after we've answered the extension question for selves, we would then have to build the other elements of personhood back in. And that's what I 
did very quickly write it into the paper. So there was no, um, there was no direct appeal to consciousness anywhere. Um, though, um, it, though agents who have access to themselves are, of course, conscious. But there's no direct appeal to consciousness. Wasn't C3 an appeal to consciousness? There's C3, the feeling? I don't think so. Quite yeah. C1 as well. Well, yeah. I, my definition of C1. No, I, I don't think C1 it does appeal to consciousness because you can have perceptions and sensations without being conscious. That's certainly right. without being conscious. Wise friends. Uh, hmm? Wise friends would consider that consciousness without being, without being necessarily in public. You still react to it as though you know it's as though. It, Somehow, you know, it's there, you know, if I ask you why you didn't yeah. verbalize it. Well, that, I mean, that, that's okay. Um, I think this is getting complicated very quickly. So let's, let's talk about it in the reception. There's a number of other people who had their hands up. Maybe uh, Claude, and then here, and then Neil. Uh, I have two questions, actually. Uh, the first one is uh, precisely the following of what was just discussed. Uh, your claim was that none of these four criteria can to support. Uh, the extent of my hypothesis. This is what yeah. I would like to yeah. explore a bit. Uh, it doesn't strike me as obvious. Uh, take criterion C3, where uh, the criterion is I extend uh, as far as my mental states extend. Now, if we accept content externality, uh, it would seem that part of my mental state, I mean, the content, uh, is to some extent external. So you might want to distinguish between the part which is internal and the part which is external, but that is sort of slipper. Uh, so it would seem, uh, first I know, right in C3, coupled with content externality, uh, would tend to support external uh, external uh, basis. Uh, and I, I'm, the second question is uh, everything uh, revolves around what is what is it essentially to be much. So there seems to be a distinction working there, scholastic distinction actually, between essence and accidents. I mean, uh, there are some things I can lose without ceasing to be myself. Mm -hmm. right? I can lose my bladder, I don't even have one. If I had one, I should lose it. But, uh, but I could also lose some things that are traditionally inside. Concentrate for the same part of my memory, part of your suing a particular memory, and so on. Yep. So, uh, how far do you want to, to play on this distinction between what right. is essential and what is accidental to be uh, a part of your person? Well, with you, I don't want to play at all. You know so much more about this stuff than I do. But let, let me let me say a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, C three is carefully couched. It's not any old mental state I have at all, the mental state that I can access by or from the point of view of having or feeling or doing them. Now, if you respond to that by saying that we can be aware of external content simply by having the representation of it, uh, then my suspicion is that I'm going to have to, to make the case I want to make about external minds, I'm going to have to go after content externalism too, which I'd rather not have to do. But if I do, I do. Uh, uh, no, sorry. Let's, let's keep it keep in order for me. Um. Uh, the second question. Um, I'm tending to use a fairly. Um, but let me back up a step. Originally, I simply put this in terms of causal versus constitutive relation. Situation cognition argues that we're in important causal relationship to our environment. You can't understand us without understanding those causal relationships to the environment. Whereas uh, the extended mind hypothesis argues that we're not just causally connected to the environment, but things outside us are part of the cognitive system we are, make it up, constitute it. Then I realized that there's actually a third um, relationship in play in which people like um, um, the extended mind, uh, the, the um, externalism uh, people argue that there are things essential to being a mind, 
which aren't necessarily part of the mind. So for Davidson, for example, no organism, no animal, no information processing system could take on the characteristics of mindedness without others accepting that it's mind, without it reaching certain norms and being judged to have reached those norms. Now, others judging that you have a mind is not part of the mind you are, but it's essential to your having a mind. That was the distinction of that. Um, I wonder, are you familiar at all with the character of uh, Chardin and his noosphere? Are you, or the written by uh, Janet Kreisberg, I guess several years ago, uh, positing the idea of the internet being developed in your consciousness and mind and so on? I guess that's taking the extended mind. Are yep. you perfect? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's taking the extended mind uh, idea and heading for the stratosphere with it. Um, I, mean, I think these ideas are interesting to toss around. I think that most of the time they are simply metaphors. Um, and they're saying that something about, I mean, and these metaphors have been around a long time, way I mean, they precede the internet by years. One of the things that philosophers used to play around with 20 or 30 years ago was the idea that the population of China might be a single mind. And what properties would that have, and so on. Um, I've got nothing against these kinds of explorations of the imagination. I just think that uh, the systems being talked about invariably lack really basic and important properties of mindfulness, such as volition, the ability to make deliberate conscious decisions. So I mean, that's, that's my quick and dirty response to that. I'm just uh, wondering, I mean, C1 seems to, kind of seems to beg the question a little bit, right? I mean, you're fixing the limit on the body, and if you don't have that fixation, um, if I'm extending my thoughts up, for instance, in the decision-making process, making a pro-con list of what I'm, in order to make another decision, um, I mean, in the same way that I'm manipulating symbols there, you could say I would be manipulating the symbols internally, uh, using the parity principle. Um, but I don't have access to my brain, so C2 and 3 uh, kind of go away. And so realistically speaking, if one was to say that C1 takes a question and get rid of it, I mean, are we not in danger of losing the brain by your characteristics as well? Uh, I mean, I can't control my brain by willing action. I, I don't have any sensation there because all of the neurons are non-sensory, and uh, the part of my state is the decision-making process, the brain's not a state of this thing. That's a very neat question. I've never been asked it before, and I wish you hadn't asked it now. Sorry. <laughs> uh, um, and like, like Claude's question, it pushes me into a, into a, a bigger uh, uh, domain of discourse. I'm going to have to think about this, and I might take it back later. But what I'm inclined to say right now is that when we are talking about human persons or human agents, we are talking about something characterized functionally, characterized by its capacities, what it can do. And the question of, and so and we can determine the boundaries of, of that system, the functionally characterized system. How far do these capacities extend? And the, uh, my suggestions for sensible ways of doing this are all functional suggestions. They're all suggestions couched in terms of what agents can do. Um, the question how this system, functionally characterized, relates to a system structurally characterized or characterized in terms of composition by neurons is a separate question. Um, we already know the broad outlines of what the answer will be. We know that the functional system won't extend to all aspects of the structural system. There's important aspects of the brain that have no cognitive function at all. They are to do with waste elimination or controlling breathing rates or digestion or whatever. So we know the functional system won't extend to all aspects of the structural system. But which ones it does extend to is, you know, that would be a job for cognitive neuroscience in the end. That's what I'm inclined to say right now. Tomorrow? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I'm puzzled why you want such a sharp boundary between the mind and the external world. Maybe it's a continuum. 
maybe I, I bring to the point, I think it's a very good point that uh, as human beings, we enter into very flexible companies with the outside. Mm -hmm. But still, we, 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 we also enter into very tight companies at times with other people, with uh, instruments. Uh, <coughs> for example, this person is very clean. If you're a good driver, the same, but you become the car, you become the boat, you feel the boat, you feel what the boat is uh, sub subject to. And you, your actions, you don't move your body, you move the boat. And if you're a good sailor, mm -hmm. you're susceptible to that. And you project yourself into the boat. And of course, once you leave the boat to somebody else, you might enter a car, you might talk to, to your wife, you might become a professor or a student. But there are times when the company is so tight that the external voice becomes part of you. Yeah, I, I, mean, I don't have any problem with that. Um, it's not on the summary slide, but it is on the previous one. That, um, that, um, there. Um, I see no difficulty whatsoever with extending cognition to prosthetics and tools. And um, you know, uh, a 30 meter sailing boat is a pretty big prosthetic or tool, but certainly you can be in the same relationship to it. That is to say, you can control it by willing basic actions. You don't need to. You don't need to think how far do I have to turn the wheel in order to make the boat stay straight in this trough. You can. You simply want the boat to stay straight in, in the trough. Uh, so I don't have any problem with that. Um, why am I inclined to be fairly hard nosed about being old fashioned about this in general? Well, um, I can give you two reasons. One of which is uh, lame and flat footed, and the other of which is. Um, Lame and flat footed, anyway. The lame and flat footed one is, I think, this is where the facts take us. It's where the facts take us. I don't think that any, any argument that has been made, I don't think any evidence has been adduced that leads us to change our traditional picture of human personhood. Um, the other reason is that I think that human personhood is extremely important. Uh, I think that having um, reasonably uh, cleanly separated uh, persons as the basic unit of discourse in ethics, politics, culture, religion, not religion so much, um, economics, uh, throughout the whole range of the social sciences and social thought is an extremely important fact. Um, if, I mean, just to give one example, if the notion of human personhood um, was relaxed in the ways that various people have advocated, people from Clark and Chalmers through Foucault and Derrida. Um, we, would, we would, or at least we should, rethink the foundation of our whole legal system. Because our whole legal system is built on the idea of individual human persons bearing most of the time responsibility for their actions. And so if I can retain this notion, in some way I like, like traditional form, I want to do so. And I, do, I think the facts a lot of that. Um, Okay. Uh, so, even in a, a single, single person, a single brain, there's certain aspects of it that don't require any, like, uh, don't require any energy. Uh, while there's certain things that you, uh, if you're like a boss of a an enterprise, you won't, you can't. Uh, 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 say to somebody else, there's, uh, there's certain things that you. In charge, and like, uh, uh, the more a uh, uh, lot of uh, jobs are uh, replaced, many people are replaced by robots, etc. Uh, mainly uh, uh, manual uh, um, that just require motor skills, but uh, like uh, okay, so we can do it. yeah, I take the point where you went. Where you went, went. Uh, so uh, I'm, 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 I'm saying there's a lot of things that are. Uh, just uh, uh, not don't character characterize uh, hum humans mostly characterize like uh, or animals and uh, uh, things that are like basically uh, instinct. But uh, as a species, we uh, would characterize us as like uh, the top of the iceberg, not the bottom of the iceberg. Like, uh, Conscious of each other, but what we're, we're after is uh, 
the prefrontal lobes, etc., which are uh, things that make a smooth human that can't really be replaced by a computer? Well, we can't yet. I mean, the jury is still very much other than that. Uh, and that actually uh, connects to something else, and that is uh, the changing levels of optimism in cognitive science. Um, 30 years ago, um, um, Herb Simon and Al Newell once said at a conference, within 10 years, 15 at the most, we'll have computational systems of greater computational power than the human mind. Um, similarly, in an equally uh, feckless bit of optimism, um, uh, Martin Minsky once gave one of his graduate students as a summer project to design an artificial vision system. Uh, well, <laughs> we still don't have an artificial vision system as much good. This is almost 40 years later. And certainly no artificial uh, cognitive system begins to have the capacity of the human mind. Um, so we're much more sober-sided and realistic than in the heyday of cognitive science. Will we get there someday? Who knows? Um, as to the, the basic point you're making, that um, we're by far the most complex cognitive system, um, so far known, though in fact the uh, dolphin, dolphins and porpoises are interesting because they have communicative strings that have as much structure to them as ours. And so the problem there may be that we don't know how to interpret the strings. But bar barring a few cases like that, sure. Um, and um, as I said, in response to a few challenges uh, from the direction of animal cognition, one of the advantages this gives us is we're less closely coupled to our environments than any other species of them. If we can reproduce the environment cognitively hardened around with us, then we know we're out of the Like uh, verbal skills, uh, verbs, grammar, and uh, nouns. And well, yeah, I mean, language is certainly part of what allows us to do this. I mean, the crucial thing, I think, is our extraordinary, I mean, extraordinary memories. I mean, astonishing memories compared to any of the species of animals. Nope. Oh, great. Um, well, I don't want to um, bring back too much of the whole mind-body dualism debate, but um, when you're talking here about your definition of personhood um, and a person or a human agent being the viewpoint from which you're looking at maybe the mind and its limits, it would seem, and you use the argument of like the legal system catering to the unit of a person, um, it would seem that this unit, this single entity, is more so a result of us having a body than a defining aspect of our minds. I would think that most of us would probably say that personhood is where our body ends and our mind extends into the world around us in ways that do extend far beyond our body. Well, um, yeah, it's a good thing that <coughs> bodies at least have fairly clear boundaries and we really have, we, we really have a problem. Um, I think, as I said, the idea that the mind extends beyond the brain, for example, is simply a metaphor. I don't think, uh, I think Chalmers and Clark, among the very few people in the history of writing on related subjects, who have actually maintained as a matter of literal fact that part of the cognition I do, I do outside my body. Not many people have maintained that. I mean, the other, the other uh, strong thesis has been, been maintained, um, th and this more by French thinkers than, than uh, English, uh, people writing in English, though there are some in English, like Dan Dennett, at least Dan Dennett, 15 years ago, who have maintained that there's something deeply suspect about the idea uh, a single, well-defined, highly unified, highly integrated mind. But that's a different thesis from the thesis that highly integrated, highly unified minds are just a lot bigger than we thought they were. And the two theses need to be distinguished. I'm not a big fan of either one of them, but there are two different theses. Uh, I, I think I've been a big handicap in finding a non-trivial question to ask you because I'm, I think you're right. <laughs> so it's fine. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's an unfortunate state of affairs. But, um, but I think I have one. Uh, and that is, and the only way I can do it, since I think you're right, is to ask why would you have considered this 
notion worthy of taking on in the first place that the line is extended uh, to these uh, stratospheric uh, limits. And, uh, and, and, I, and it's the word line in the end. If we, if we agree, it's a little bit related to the brain question that you fended off over there. If we agree that in talking about a mind, we're also talking about a mental state in some way. A mental state that I, the person, am in. Okay. Um, the stuff about uh, sensors, extended prostheses, is not about mental states. It's about behavioral capacities. It's, it's, it's a functional state, but it's not a mental state yet until further notice. Now, th th that was similar to the question about the brain. And those are also functional states. And you gave the right answer with that functional structure business, which is it's going to take empirical work to figure out which subsets of the functional states are, in fact, the mental states rather than some other kind. Well, isn't all of this just about behavioral states rather than mental states? I mean, is it quite dead obvious, as you said, that the mental states don't go beyond these parts? The example that was given about the spider web, the spider is in the mental state. It's not its web that's in the mental state. It needs the web to get some of its inputs, but that's all. Well, as you said, I'm not going to be inclined to disagree no. with that. Um, I mean, why did I take this on? Because. Um, The Chalmers Clark paper, and incidentally, the, the way they uh, the way they describe the authorship of the paper is very interesting in its own right. Um, Andy Clark is listed as first author, Dave Chalmers is listed as second author, and then there's a footnote, and the footnote says authors listed in order of conviction in the thesis. <laughs> uh, clearly, clearly, Clark was convinced that it's right. And, Chalmers thought it was at least worth exploring. Um, well, why did, I, why did I take it on? Because A, I think it's wrong. B, it's got a lot of airplay. And C, if it became widely believed, it could be quite mischievous in various ways. Yeah. I'd like to get back to the end of the thesis by uh, talking about Chalmers. And, uh, uh, if, uh, I, I think that uh, if you're discussing with these people and you start with the expression, keep in mind that, while listening to my argument, keep in mind that, uh, obviously they wouldn't put it to their blackberry to keep it in mind. So in, in some sense, senses, mind it does, not, does not extend to the blackberry. But at the same time, the Otto and Inga argument, if you think about prospective memory as a cognitive function, uh, you have an appointment tomorrow, don't forget it. It doesn't matter very much if I think of it by myself, or if Townsville or the device re reminds me. So it seems that mind changes meaning. And, and in discussing it, if you have some, you're trying to discuss on the interpretation of something, and if you could switch meaning, you could always uh, go against the other person by selecting or appropriate meaning. But essentially, my, my question is, what is the intuition behind this extended mind hypothesis that might be worth considering and if we want to extend the capacity, like just like we have glasses to extend the vision and uh, some operations and, and uh, steroids and whatever. So it seems that there is some basic intuition that we might agree with. That, uh, and I think that the Otto and Inga argument might be a good place to start and uh, our perspective. So if you were to defend that thesis instead of... Well, I mean, well, yes. Well, what do you retain on this? Um, approach. I'm going to say at least two things will surprise you maybe a bit. Um, one is that um, the, the underlying um, inspiration for the idea of the extended mind seems to me to be important and entirely right. I take the underlying inspiration to be the, the fundamental idea behind situation cognition. That there's something that there's something deeply suspect about studying human beings by yanking them out of their natural environment and putting them in the artificial environment of psychoanalysis. That uh, this at least raises the question as to whether a lot of the results you get are actually a reflection of human competence and human capacity. No, but much of it comes in my or it are. doesn't stop being a person or at the mind before you decide the mind. It's just placing the person in a rather controlled environment. Yeah, and, and there's no environment at all. And as I said, the risk that creates is the results you get are artifacts in the artificial environment, not reflections of 
natural cognition. Um, the other thing I was going to say, if I can remember what it was. Oh, it's, it's, what's that? I wanted to hear something about uh, extending mind by technology, like the prospective memory example. Did you know oh, yeah. yeah. that? Yeah. Well, I mean, um, one of the awkwardnesses from my point of view is precisely memory. Because if you think through memory in terms of the four suggestions, um, it's not clear that at least long term memory, you know, the post one month or post three year memory, um, comes out as part of me. Um, I mean, as, as, <clears throat> as some philosopher once said, one person's modus pollens, another person's modus tollens. Clark and Chung would want to argue that Otto's notebooks count as memory and count as part of him. An alternative is to argue that Inga's memory is not part of her. Um, and my criteria push us in that direction. Now, I think that there's things I can do about that, but it certainly a worrying consequence of my approach because certainly in the traditional picture of the human person, memory is part of people, not a tool available to people. I'm going to go with people who haven't got in yet. Um, if my mind is extended beyond my skin, uh, doesn't it seem that my, what happens when my skin dies and what's inside? Uh, I understand that it's possible to conceive that my mind uh, survives in some way. <laughs> Distributed in the society or no? So that's my problem. My first question: What does the what does uh, this author say about this? And my other question is: Then what does it take to create a mind? If I can do without the, the skin, what's inside? In that case, can I create a human mind proper without creating a uh, skin? Well, that's one of the age-old questions about artificial intelligence. Um, whether intelligence of our kind requires our kind of body. And certainly the assumption of classical cognitive science was that it doesn't, that you can have our kind of intelligence in physical systems very unlike us, living systems that aren't even alive. And that's why for the first 15 or 20 years of cognitive science, cognitive researchers pay almost attention, almost no attention to the brain. The assumption was the brain was merely how cognition gets implemented, it can get implemented in other ways, so this is neutral to the nature of cognition. No, aren't too many people believe that anymore. But it was certainly <clears throat> widely held view. And to take up your point, it's certainly connected to a kind of deep dive dualism in early cognitive science. Not quite an old-fashioned Cartesian kind, but nevertheless dualism between function and structure. Um, our minds live on. Well, I mean, yes and no. If I write an important book, that, I hope, will survive me. Um, if not, I kind of wasted my time. But will my volition, will my values, will my point of view in the world, will my unified consciousness survive me? Not unless there's some kind of immortality of the kind I suspect there is. Thank you. Okay, well, I'd like to take something that you said in a previous lecture and see kind of how you interpret this with this in mind. Um, in the lecture that you gave at McGill University yesterday morning, you spoke of an interesting linguistical side note, which was that when you were talking of consciousness, linguistical structure we used to distinguish between conscious and non-conscious beings, um, and then also to say that conscious beings can be either conscious or unconscious also extends to a host of other maybe term of the art kind of words such as rationality, morality, intelligence. Um, and it would seem that in this whole framework, the um, main bulk of situated cognition uh, is very uh, applicable to that linguistic framework in particular just because um, whereas body and mind help us distinguish between non-conscious and conscious things, situated cognition helps us um, describe the social interplay involved in determining whether a conscious being is in unconscious or conscious, immoral or moral, etc. And I was just wondering, in that light, um, that seems to be a very useful way of interpreting since it allows us to change the discourse on all these other topics of discussion, intelligence, etc. But what would the specific extended mind hypothesis have to say on that that you would particularly agree or disagree with? 
why don't we talk about the reception? Just so, I mean, the points you're making are interesting, but it would take me 10 minutes to describe the framework you're referring to. And I suspect that if I keep people seated for 10 more minutes, I'm going to start to get a rebellion. So let's talk about it in, uh, at the reception. Great. I think two, Neil, and then here, to we'll see where we're at in time. Oh, sorry, you haven't been in yet. Yeah, no. Um, I was just wondering, uh, sort of actually in response to points that were made earlier, when uh, you start discounting things in the spider webs and whatnot, I mean, aren't you at a risk of going too far when you cut? I mean, if you say that perception, perception is supposed to be one of the core cognitive systems, but if we say that eyes are just the things that let us see, we don't need those, I mean, how far back can you go? And also, aren't you in danger at a certain point of causing an oncologist? I mean, if you can say, well, there's this little thing that thinks and takes in, then does the actual crunching of my perception I mean, have you sort of positive of a by doing that? Um, depends on whether you think the conscious, volitional, human receiving agent is a month of, a month of this I actually just don't think you need to cut the guys in the visual cortex. Well, you know, I mean, the the charge of postulating a homunculus becomes a charge only when you're using something like the human agent to explain something like the human agent, engage in a kind of circularity. Uh, I don't think I'm doing that. I'm using the human agent as a test bed on which to explore ideas about how far agents extend. And so I think I'm okay on that score. Um, Can I be pushed too far in? Well, that was, that was the worry I was raising in connection with memory. And if you have other places where that worry might arise, I guess I'd be interested to hear about them. Um, I mean, I think, well, let me, let me make a very general point about this. Um, as I said, I'm an old-fashioned kind of guy about these questions. But I also am not so old-fashioned as to think that um, our folk wisdom about personhood got it entirely right the first time. And you know, our sense of how far persons extend and what they're made up of and what kind of powers they have can certainly undergo revision. I just don't see any basis for a really radical revision of the kind that Clark and Chalmers advocate. Uh, what about the studies in uh, sensory deprivation and uh, <coughs> uh, contribute to it? Because I know it can be used as a form of torture uh, uh, where mind to a certain extent, you see, you really notice that uh, we need some sort of context or, or not just a context text, but some theme or, or another, so mind uh, naturally invents one to fill up that gap. Yeah. Well, again, um, I, would, I would focus on the distinction I made between um, the causal relationships the minds are in and what's the same as the mind. <clears throat> and I've got no problem with the idea at all that um, we're causally dependent on all sorts of things outside us. Uh, and sensory input may be one of them. I mean, there's a basic story about sensory deprivation, at least the one I've heard, which I'm actually definitely working on myself, <clears throat> is that um, if you put someone in a situation of complete sensory deprivation, they've got great big pads on their hands and they're floating in water so they have no sense of their own weight and their own location, and they're completely blind, and their ears are. Uh, are completely stopped off so they can't hear anything. You cut off all external sense of sensation. Within about 24 hours, most people start to go absolutely bananas. And they just break down properly. They start to hallucinate, they lose their capacity to follow simple lines of argument, and so on. Um, this could be thought to illustrate two things. One is that we're not as immediately and tightly coupled to our environment as many other species. You know, we get the 24 hour window but that we are still coupled to our environment. Now, if that's so, my suggestion would be that this is a causal cut, that in the same way as you need nutrition, you need stimulation. Does your need for nutrition make you your food? No. Does your need for stimulation make you the stimulation? No. Um, and what Chalmers and Clark are arguing, as I said, is not just that we're causally dependent on the environment in various ways, and you go the other way too, we have lots of causal impacts on the environment. They're arguing that we actually extend out into the environment. 
that part of our environment, roughly the part that's made up of our cognitive tools, is part of what we are as, as cognitive beings. And that's the, that's the radical claim. It's the one that I don't see much basis for. How do many of you treat our uh, system systems as cognitive tools? And to what extent do you move the gradual at these content to I'm sorry, the so big bear can shut it right out. So. For linguistic systems, I was wondering how you would you consider our language systems to be external like, cognitive tools, or and how much of them would, like, how much external would you grant that kind of system? Well, I mean, it, it would, you know, that question, I think, uh, would have to be set against the four criteria. Um, let's go back to them. Oops. Um, we are aware of, we can control language by uh, controlling basic actions. We are um, aware of um, many states of our linguistic competence simply by having those states. And so at least that much mind can fall within. Uh, that much of my language is me. Um, the interesting question would be, for example, syntax, where except for a tiny handful of linguistic theorists, we all know how to do syntax, and none of us knows what we're doing. I mean, I can tell you what sentences sound right and what don't, but if you ask me what rules I'm using to make those judgments, in most cases, I have no idea. Um, and there's a lot of that in cognition. I mean, when you do arithmetic, uh, you generally speaking can tell someone how the numbers hang together. You can't tell people anything about the inferential processes that is allowing you, that are allowing you to apply these rules to these numbers to get this answer. And so there's a whole substructure of cognition that's like that. We know how to do it. We have no access to it. <clears throat> exactly how that would fall out is an interesting question. Because that, would, that could be supported, that could support that as much as like the mind being very internal and structure, but but um, in the case of language, you can't deny that there's so much, um, like, or maybe you can't deny that there's like the linguistic community that your mind kind of projects. Sure, but again, the question is, is that linguistic community part of what you are, or is it something that you're in a complex relationship to, something that's not you, that you're in a relationship to it? Yeah? Um, my question is, uh, uh, what Clark and Chalmers Charm are really saying, do they say that the cognition is also out of the head, or do they say that the mind is also out of the head? Because I believe that the self criteria you give uh, do, do give a fatal blow to the claim that the mind is also out of the head, but not to the claim that the cognition are also out of the head. No, I agree with that. And the reason for that, as I said, is the notion of cognition or of cognitive system is a notion that is an invention of cognitive research. And we can define it any way we like. And so to make the Chalmers Clark claim interesting, you have to translate it out of the language of cognitive system into some other concepts where what they are saying could be true or false, not simply by definition, but on the basis of facts. And my candidate was to translate it in terms of in, into a claim of human agency. The human agents extend or do not extend beyond the skin. Anybody who hasn't got in yet? Hmm?